Okay. Um, right, um, thanks for coming along everyone. Just a couple of housekeeping things before I hand over to Bill. Um, so yeah, it's a bit of a shame that we've got to move to online for our conservation seminars. I'm actually in the David Attenborough building with um, David Attenborough in the background here. Um, so just some yeah, quick housekeeping things. If everyone can keep their camera and sound off while the speakers are speaking. Um, if you've got questions as we go along, if you can just put them in the chat box. And if you've got a, a weird username, it'd be really nice if you put your actual name alongside the question. Um, and we'll come to questions at the end. Um, and yeah, I guess that, that's kind of it really. We're recording this. Um, it will be available on the Hive and the CCI website in due course. So just to let everyone know you're being recorded as well. Um, and I will hand over to Bill to introduce our speakers. Uh, thanks, Julia. So you all know about the regular CCI seminar series and we've gone online, uh, which is a great pity because you can't go for drinks afterwards or those sorts of things and have those informal interactions, which is so key to these sessions. But, um, but it does provide some other opportunities. So we're um, running one a week and we're taking the advantage of having a much more global mix than we normally would. So normally we're looking for people within easy travel of Cambridge, and here, for many of these sessions, we've looked for people that aren't within easy travel of Cambridge. So we're having a very much a global conservation group, which is fantastic. Before we start, I, I just thought we should um, reflect on the sad loss of Georgina Mace. Uh, I think everybody knows the name Georgina Mace. Everyone knows how influential she's been. I think almost everybody here has in some way or other been influenced by her work. And I know very many people here I've been very influenced personally by her, that she's, she's, she was sort of a real driver, made a real difference to so many people's lives. Uh, she was a, a real pioneer in conservation. She was there right from the very beginning. Uh, as Andrew, Andrew Bamford said, if it wasn't for her, I'm not quite sure whether or not CCI and the David Attenborough building would exist. Um, she underpinned so much of conservation practice and she's just such a kind, clever person. So I just thought you should acknowledge the role she's played, the role she's played to CCI, and we miss her. So, uh, after that sad note, uh, some, I'll say something more positive, moving on to pandemics, uh, something equally depressing. Um, what we'd like to do in this session is talk about pandemics and what we can do to stop future pandemics, uh, which is obviously a topical issue at the moment. We have three speakers. Uh, we're very much going to talk about uh, Sylvia's going to talk in general about the issue, and then Amy and Chris are going to talk very much about the wildlife trade. So um, uh, we'll have our three presentations, and then we'll have talks at the end. Uh, and if you could put questions in the chat box, I'll try, we'll try calling you up rather than just reading out the questions, which is a little bit dull. We'll see if we can get the people to appear and speak, but we'll see whether or not that works. Uh, so first of all, Sylvia Petrovan. Uh, I'm sure many of you know him from around the building. Uh, he was a vet, uh, he's an expert on amphibians and reptiles, uh, works very hard on evidence-based conservation, uh, and there's a major project on uh, what you can do to stop future pandemics, uh, which he led. So over to you, Sylvie. Thank you very much, Bill. I'll share my screen. All right, here we go. Um, yeah, hello everyone. I was reflecting um, when um, when I was invited to give this talk. I was reflecting on the fact that it's been now two and a half months. So we put out a preprint of um, of this uh, large piece of work that we've worked on, and uh, Amy and, and Chris um, were uh, very much integral to, to that process. And when we when we launched the preprint, the interesting thing is that uh, the journalist feedback was that people were a bit fed up with uh, pandemics and hearing about this, and yet it's uh, more present now than even um, it was in June. Um, so I'm going to sort of briefly discuss about the sort of generalities, I suppose, as Bill mentioned about the project and how this arose. Um, 
I think the, the important element to, to realize is that, yes, there have been numerous warnings about uh, future pandemics, um, and there are increasing discussions um, about whether or not this uh, current one was avoidable. Um, and there have been a range of proposed solutions, um, but quite a few of them actually appear narrow, and I'm briefly going to discuss the, the reasons why we think that is the case. But also, as part of a bigger process, it made us think that there's a need for larger scale rethinking for how to potentially reduce uh, risks more generally from emerging uh, diseases, specifically those which have um, a high possibility of human to human transmission rate um, and therefore could, uh, could generate pandemics, but specifically the ones that um, could spill over from, from animals into humans. And as I mentioned, this was part of a larger piece of work or I suppose a separate piece of work that uh, came out um, from um, my almost immediately as we went into lockdown we started thinking this isn't really um, going to last forever hopefully um, and that it would be very important for us because we are in this business i suppose we do evidence synthesis and uh, bill um, and uh, his group actually have run a large series of solution scans we looked at how we could actually um, synthesize the information and present the options for societal measures to reduce transmission rate and uh, to sort of go back to, to some kind of normality. Discussion that is still very much valid today. And initially as part of that, we started looking at um, uh, preventing further transmission from, uh, from wildlife and from, from animals, I suppose, into, into humans. And that ended up actually becoming a separate and, and larger uh, piece of work, which, which is this. And uh, the preprint is, is out. You can find it on the um, Open Science Foundation website. Um, it's a very large collaboration with 25 extraordinary um, scientists working in, in different areas of research. So, in relation to this, yes, we know that there, the rate of um, appearance of new emerging infectious diseases, most of which have a wildlife origin, is increasing. And uh, Kate Jones at UCL has done a lot of work in relation to that. But also there's this um, description of uh, SARS-CoV-2 as being a perfect example of a zoonosis spilling from wildlife and establishing shortly afterwards in, in the human population. So it addresses very much the, the points uh, that, that we were trying to raise. But then also you can see this is uh, some work that, that, that Amy and, uh, and her colleagues at Oxford have been working on looking at why um, specific solutions uh, such as the ones that were initially discussed in relation to wildlife trade would potentially not work. And there have been a whole range of these calls, uh, numerous initiatives, uh, petitions, uh, all, all, kinds of, um, all kinds of projects framed differently, some um, about um, introducing bans for eating wild animals, others for banning uh, wildlife markets, others for banning uh, wet markets, which is actually an even broader definition that uh, some people aren't um, necessarily very clear on, but it actually encompasses you know, all kinds of fresh produce rather than just wildlife, which tends to represent a very small percentage. Um, but you know, very early on, actually, there are also uh, discussions about the fact that this has been in effect uh, discussed before and to some degree has already been done. Uh, so after the um, SARS um, epidemic um, in 2003, China actually did establish several management policies and regulations of wildlife markets. However, even then there were issues with the fact that the definition of wildlife was complicated. It actually allowed um, confusions and, and loopholes. And specifically, it actually failed to differentiate between captive bred and wild populations. And with this in mind, one of the very early, and from my point of view, very unexpected issues that we had to deal with uh, for, for the solution scanning was that as a group, we ended up having quite a lot of discussions um, about how to very specifically define the categories of, of animals that we refer to, whether they were wild or captive or um, um, animals that, that were domesticated or not. The definitions actually in, in many cases seem simple enough, but once you really start delving into the detail, it does become um, very complicated. Uh, but those have real implications because, you know, framing um, a legal ban, uh, for instance, in relation to wildlife means that potentially um, it actually does not include other categories of animals. And 
we looked we as part of the solutions can we have a very broad and very big review um, which looks at the pathways and, and mechanisms and as I said we know that most um, emerging infectious diseases originate in wild animals primarily in non-human primates rodents and bats and we do discuss um, quite the depth the the reasons why that would be uh, why that would be the case so for instance in relation to non-human primates uh, you know, monkeys and apes there's um, obviously a close evolutionary uh, link between humans and uh, and those animals, and therefore there's a um, sort of simpler uh, possibility for um, disease transmission. However, with rodents and bats, although there's a lot of literature about this, um, and it proposes numerous mechanisms such as high fecundity, um, and um, the fact that they uh, rodents, for instance, have very fast-paced uh, life histories, while in bats, um, Obviously, because they, they fly, they can congregate in, um, in large colonies, they move big distances, but also they have um, physiological adaptations to flight, which actually might make them more, I suppose, more resistant to, to diseases. However, there are still discussions about this, and some of the sort of simpler um, um, suggestions might be that this is uh, potentially only a numbers game, and it's the fact that uh, rodents and bats are extremely specious that mean that they also potentially uh, host an um, enormous um, um, diversity of, of pathogens. But yes, most of them or many of them are actually transmitted to humans through intermediate hosts, uh, which can be companion farmed or, or feral animals. And the contact between humans and domestic animals has led to a recent zoonotic emergence event such as uh, swine flu, uh, but also MERS, so the Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome. Um, and I suppose on a slightly worrying and depressing note, although there are fewer than 300 viruses um, that are known to infect people, there are potentially um, some around 700,000 um, viruses of a zoonotic potential that have yet to be discovered and, um, um, and I suppose uh, identified properly. Um, but yes, pathogen transmission from wildlife to humans is influenced uh, both by host and pathogen diversity as well as land use change. And this is for, for people involved in conservation, obviously, this is a um, 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 particularly important issue. The way in which we structured, I'm not going to talk too much about this, but very briefly, just to illustrate, we divided the, um, uh, the solution scan options into um, different sections. So you can see there we, we include both supply side, transport and sale consumption, and we also have a section looking at uh, capacity and government commitments as part of the enabling environment. And then we look both at wild species and domestic animals. And as I said, the reason for this is there is obviously transmission potential from wild species, but also from wild species to humans via domesticated animals or via animals that are actually not domesticated, but rather living in captivity in uh, one way or another. And we have identified, I suppose, or we, we structure different um, and multiple complex uh, pathways, um, which are particularly relevant because our suggestion is that the next pandemic uh, that we would be looking at trying to prevent uh, would not necessarily, um, I suppose, emerge into, into the human population using the same mechanisms because there are multiple mechanisms. So it can be through the direct contact uh, with or the use of wild animals, um, such as Ebola or HIV AIDS. It can be through um, commercial trade of wild animals, potentially, um, uh, which has been the, the reason for COVID-19 emergence, although there's still quite a lot of uncertainty in relation to that the breeding, rearing, and trade of wild animals, such as SARS via, via civets, um, the uh, domesticated animals, um, including MERS, bird flu, and, and swine flu, but also um, aspects related to the evolution of micro antimicrobial resistance, which we didn't deal with, and also pathogen release from, from laboratories and um, the international intentional creation of life. So, I'm not going to go through all the options. You can, you can have a look in the preprint. We structured them um, in relation to these pathways so that people actually have a good understanding of, uh, of, how they can, um, of how they can be identified. But we have uh, in total 161 options for practitioners and policymakers, which include very different things from, you can see some uh, that I have listed in here, 
focusing on, as I said, on, on these um, different pathways. So laws, for instance, to prevent um, the mixing of wild animals, and I think Chris is, and, and Amy are going to discuss about this quite a lot, and the mixing of wild and domestic animals at different stages, um, the protection of food and collection harvest processes, such as sap tapping from contamination from, from wildlife, um, increasing switching to, to plant-based foods and reduction of uh, reducing consumption. So a whole range of, of options. Um, and I think ultimately, yes, there are the important element I suppose to remember is that preventing the next pandemic is not necessarily about animals, um, certainly not only about wild animals, but rather how we interact with uh, both wildlife and with domesticated animals. Ultimately, it's about changing human behavior and our relationship um, with, with animals. And it includes some simple ways potentially, um, such as encouraging smallholders to better separate um, poultry from, from people, especially in, uh, in parts of um, in parts of the world where um, some people might actually live on top of uh, these sort of small um, areas where where poultry might be might be housed, whereas others actually really require very significant investment and um, and um, well financial commitment. Um, looking at improving biosecurity and introducing uh, veterinary and hygiene standards for for farmed animals across the world, which is a very big commitment, but one that we think is uh, very important. And ultimately, there are also really important um, avenues uh, that are very related to conservation in relation to ecosystem management, restoration, rewilding, halting habitat loss, and land use change, all of which potentially have uh, very important roles to play in, uh, in preventing and mitigating pathogen emergence and transmission. And I suppose just to highlight that, yes, we did not include antimicrobial resistance because it actually has quite different pathways, including pollution, and already the, our, our list was enormous. But this is really a critical topic. So even without having any additional um, emergence of um, emer of um, infectious diseases from wildlife, um, antimicrobial resistance in itself could actually generate the next pandemic. And just to finalize, um, um, the, I suppose the nice element was that uh, despite what the, what the journalists warned us about um, in relation to the fact that people had actually lost, uh, I suppose, uh, interest as it were already by June in, um, in COVID-19, there was a lot of, um, of media interest in, uh, in the work that we produced. Um, very interestingly, actually, a lot of it was um, in South America. In Brazil, in particular, there were thousands of downloads of, of the preprint from Brazil alone. Um, and that, you know, that can only be a good thing, I suppose. Um, and to finalize, I suppose, just in relation to uh, also the, the politicizing that you see currently all the time in relation to science and scientific endeavors was the fact that on the same day when The Lancet uh, had the um, editorial which was presenting the, the solution scan and how they thought that this was very much the way forward in relation to engaging experts who are producing policy relevant documents. Um, I was looking um, at um, one of the uh, newspapers that presented our work and you can see the one of the quotes in fact actually it was the highest rank quote which said whenever any newspaper column contains the words experts say or according to experts uh, in the first sentence I stopped reading and it really made me think quite a lot about the sort of um, as I said the politicizing of science but also about how potentially we we should uh, package things uh, differently and I will finish there So uh, thanks so much, Silvu, for um, uh, uh, a very important um, uh, and sobering talk uh, with a sobering end as well. Um, we're going to um, uh, have questions at the end. So let's move uh, straight on to Amy. Amy Hinsey, I'm sure uh, many of you know, she's a regular around the building. For those of you who remember the building, uh, she did a PhD on uh, orchids uh, and illegal trade in orchids, been working on bear bowels, very much uh, leading expert on wildlife trade. Over to you, Amy. Thank you. Um, let me 
Uh, yes, uh, thanks Bill. Um, I'll be talking to you today about the, the wildlife trade aspects of the solution scan and how we can reduce risks throughout the wildlife trade supply chain. I'm going to leave my video on for now, but I might have to turn it off in a minute because my Wi-Fi is not working very well. Um, so I just really wanted to start by just recapping what Sylvia was saying in, in his presentation about the, the reaction in the media and from lots of uh, large NGOs and organizations and individuals on, uh, on Twitter, for example, to the, the pandemic was very much that we had to ban all wildlife trade. Sometimes there was some nuance there. Again, there were different types of bans proposed, but very much the kind of dominant narrative was bans are the only thing that will ever will prevent this from ever happening again. And if we'd have had a ban in the past, it would have stopped this from happening now. Um, I thought that was a really interesting reaction and actually there was some pushback. There was a conversation article that Sylvie mentioned and uh, I spent a lot of time debating people on Twitter about this. Um, but I thought it was really interesting because it's such a powerful message and it's such a, a simple solution being proposed that we could stop this awful thing from happening again with this very, very simple policy, just ban everything. Or, I mean, hopefully there'll be some more nuance there, but a lot of the messaging, as you can see here, was just ban everything and then we'll be fine. And the problem with that approach for the wildlife trade is that the, the wildlife trade is just incredibly complex. You have lots of different actors. Uh, you have supply chains that may be local, regional, international. They'll be interacting uh, parts of those supply chains. Different actors will be taking part in different supply chains. Sometimes you'll have actors that only take part in the illegal supply chains. Some only in the legal, often there'll be some kind of uh, crossover there. So there'll be some laundering or some mixing between legal and illegal products. You have uh, wildlife products that are often processed. So it might be completely recognizable at the start when it starts um, its journey in through the trade chain, but quite quickly it might become unrecognizable or indistinguishable from other products. And I mean, that's actually underpinning a lot of the arguments for bans that it would be much easier to regulate if you completely removed all wildlife trade from the equation. However, I am firmly of the belief, and so are lots of my colleagues, that the one simple solution is unlikely to be suitable for such a complex system. Um, uh, so uh, what we need instead are these complex packages of interventions and this is kind of what the solution scan was all about. So it was looking at different options that could be used at different points in a wildlife trade supply chain to try and reduce the risk of zoonotic disease transmission. So uh, Chris is also going to be talking about wildlife trade um, and also uh, the interface I think with, with livestock there. So I am just going to focus on wildlife trade here. I'm going to talk about the supply, the trade and transport parts and the consumer um, parts and the different interventions that, that could be used at different points in the supply chain. But overall, the main message is we have to take a risk-based approach. We can't just have one simple solution that, um, that fixes everything. And we also have to really carefully think about unintended consequences. So lots of people in the world rely on wildlife, on low risk legal wildlife trade for their survival. And we have to make sure that, uh, that any kind of policies are, are taking that into account and not negatively impacting on people. Um, and we also need to think about the fact that, that, as I said, wildlife trade takes place over lots of different scales in lots of different places. And we have to consider how interventions will be applied in different locations and different contexts and at different points in the supply chain. So um, Sylvia showed the, the, um, the diagram that we had showing the different kind of points of the supply chain that we focused on. As I said, overall, the, the main um, point of these different options, these different solutions, are that um, we need to stop disease transmission, but that's in different ways and it, it applies differently to different actors at different points in the supply chain. So, um, so for example, in the supply end of the supply chain, um, harvesters, hunters, collectors, anyone that is taking a wild animal uh, out of the wild and bringing it into trade, and also farmers, so anyone in this context who is farming a wild species. So I work on, uh, as, as Bill said, I work a lot on bear bile farming in China, and so that, it, that counts as wildlife farming because that is a wild species rather than a domesticated species. And this is what Sylvia was saying. We spent a long time debating uh, what a farmed animal was and what a wild farmed animal was. It's, it's complicated. But, um, but essentially at the supply end, we want to stop disease entering the supply chain in the first place. 
in the middle, we want to, to, to kind of manage any risk around, um, around species that are already in trade. And then at the consumer end, that again is sort of trying to reduce demand and then reduce um, trade in the high risk species while also preventing consumption of high risk species, which is a one uh, key way that, um, that disease transmission would take place. Um, I'm going to talk about the kind of broad categories of intervention that we discussed at different points of the trade chain, but uh, yeah, there are 161 of them, so I'm not going to go into detail about all of them. But uh, these were kind of summarized categories that we um, discussed for the supply end of the supply chain. So you have those in the top uh, left here that are focusing on um, more on the kind of wild species in the wild. So preventing contact between high risk species and people. So one example is, is using area based interventions, things like protected areas around high risk species and, and where they might uh, have a high density like bat roosts, for example. So protected areas that focus on places like bat roosts could potentially reduce land use change, which would bring people into closer and more regular contact with, um, with bats and bat roosts. And another, another way to, to sort of pre prevent those uh, high risk or, or diseases entering the supply chain is to work closely with the hunters and the collectors who, um, who hunt these high risk species and try and co-develop some ways to reduce risk there. So either uh, by trying to shift to hunting of different species that may be lower risk, to shift to, uh, to um, different uh, livelihoods, for example, or where that's not possible to um, do things like licensing. So making sure that the only people who are hunting high risk species are those that have, uh, have high standards of hygiene and, um, and are you know, regularly uh, uh, checked for uh, their licensing rules. Um, so at the bottom left, uh, these two focus more on farming, so wildlife farming, and these are pictures from bear farms in China, if you're interested. Um, so, so I work on wildlife uh, on, on bear farms in China, which are legal in China. However, there are lots of illegal and informal wildlife farms of lots of different species all over the world. So kind of the gist of the interventions in these kind of categories was trying to bring up the standards of wildlife farming to to be as high as the standards in in domestic animal farming livestock farming so making sure that wildlife is only farmed where it is safe and legal and improving hygiene standards uh, regulation and inspections of wildlife farms to make sure that they are um, taking these uh taking hygiene seriously and um and that they are they are well regulated and, and that those regulations are being enforced around farms. So in the middle of that supply chain, the um, all of the actors uh, within the kind of trade and transport part. So you have people who process products, um, people who sell them and uh, transport companies, for example. So the point of these interventions is to prevent disease transmission. And these mainly focus on preventing mixing of different species or preventing um, uh, close contact between people and high risk animal species during transport and sale. So for example, this might include um, any vehicles that are used to transport wild animals should, uh, should be regularly inspected and should be disinfected after each journey. And uh, animals of different species shouldn't be transported in the same vehicles. Those pictures that you probably saw after the pandemic started of, um, of those wildlife markets, often called wet markets incorrectly, but wildlife markets where you had pangolins being sold um, on top of bamboo rats next to chickens and, 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 and clear mixing and very close contact between different species. Uh, so things like that need to, to be closely monitored and, and regulated and, um, and hygiene standards need to be introduced into places of sale. And, um, and uh, also during slaughter and processing. So again, implementing those standards that we would expect in, in any kind of food uh, livestock industry into the wildlife trade chain as well. And finally, we have the consumers. Again, this is very much about sort of preventing um, the trade in high-risk species from happening. 
So there are two ways of doing that from the consumer side of things. You can coerce people, so you can introduce those regulations, you can ban consumption or purchase of high risk species. Um, but again, just because something's illegal, it doesn't mean people won't use it anymore. Um, and for example, I mean, pangolins were often uh, mentioned at the start of the pandemic as being the, the uh, at least the intermediary host for um, the novel coronavirus. And the trade in pangolins, international trade at least, is definitely illegal. And I think it's also illegal on a national scale in China. So just because something's illegal, it doesn't mean people won't use it, is a really important point throughout this. And so another way of um, dealing with uh, demand, especially for illegal products, is to promote voluntary behavior change amongst consumers. So things like um, uh, campaigns to reduce demand for a product entirely or trying to switch people to a lower risk product or a synthetic product or, or a plant-based product or something that, um, something that does not carry that disease risk. And then kind of around all of that, this is the case for you know, any regulation or any interventions at all, but you have this enabling environment and that's just really important to consider that different countries involved in wildlife trade alike have different levels of capacity to identify the risks in the first place, to implement interventions such as these, um, or even identify the, the interventions that are going to be most suitable for their context, and also to enforce regulations that are already in place. So we have to ensure that the, the, that capacity is there, things like um, that uh, customs officers have uh, the, the capacity to identify uh, high risk species when they're being traded or identify illegal species and you can actually take action if, if those are found. You also need to ensure that governments are committed so that governments commit to uh, international uh, agreements such as CITES but also that they have the national legislation in place on top of that and that's actually enforced um, and also uh, the, the things like corruption that might undermine that uh, are, are dealt with so that these, um, these interventions can actually be implemented in an effective way. Which when I say it like that sounds like a really, really uh, massive job, but I think that's what we're all working with at the moment. Um, so this is just in summary, this is the same um, uh, diagram that Sylvie showed, and this is the one from the paper as well. But I just wanted to end just by reiterating that the complexity is, is so important to consider here and that we have to focus on the risk and we have, to, um, we have to really break it down and think about it step by step throughout the supply chain if we want to, to hope to, to be effective here. Thank you. Many thanks, Amy. Uh, fasc fascinating. Um, I think the, so everyone seems to think the solution is you just ban wildlife trade because we then wouldn't have pangolins. And I think the pangolin trade and the idea that pangolin trade has always been illegal just sort of shows the complexity of this and, and how you can't jump to easy solutions. Um, uh, now, I'd like to introduce Chris, Chris Walzer, uh, who um, um, was a professor in conservation medicine at Vienna. He's the um, uh, director of health at the Wildlife Conservation Society. He's done amazing work on Asiat Asiatic wild ass in Mongolia, great expert on wildlife trade. Um, uh, and has a very experienced uh, veterinary uh, links with conservation. So uh, looking forward to hearing you, Chris. So, the, um, the, um, good morning, still from the Bronx. Um, thanks very much for having me. And um, this is fun. This is um, honestly fun because um, let me just start off right at the beginning that I fundamentally disagree with many of the comments that have been made this morning. And um, for those, thankfully, I'm not on Twitter, but um, you can follow this on Twitter going back and forth all the time. So I just want to, before I jump into this, I want to um, make clear that um, I am, I and the organization I represent, and especially the health program, um, we've been standing up and very um, rigorously demanding an end to the commercial, and I really want to emphasize that word, the commercial trade in wildlife focused mostly on mammals and birds. And I'm going to try to, I'm not going to try to convince you, of course, I just like, but I'm looking forward to discussing this 
Um, and it's been a pleasure working with Sylvia and, and Amy on this. Um, but there are some fundamental differences. And I think this is the great thing, and this is the fun part of um, being able to discuss this here today. And um, since we obviously didn't um, plan um, on how we were going to do this, I'm going to skip through a lot of um, some of my slides and then just sort of focus on individual um, aspects of my talk. Um, so for this group here, I can skip across the background of um, in the context that this pandemic is happening. One of the things though I have revisited and I just put it out there is that, you know, back in the 10 years ago or, or so, there was quite a lot of talk about um, how nature no more doesn't run the earth anymore and that we do and we just need to get good at it. And I think it's, it's an interesting time and I point this out to a lot of policymakers as well that I have been interacting with um, since, since January on this. Um, this is obviously a very flawed assumption and this pandemic has really brought it home. Here in the United States, of course, as, as many other places, the pandemic has brought home quite a lot of other um, massive societal issues, of course. Now, when we um, talk about zoonotic origin pathogens, I think all of you are aware of these. It is important though to understand that what we're really interested in, and always when we talk about wildlife trade in this context, it is about emerging infectious diseases and it's in the context of emerging infectious diseases which have epidemic or pandemic um, potential. Um, there are a lot of zoonotic diseases out being discussed in the same context which do not have the same um, dynamics. So for example, two days ago was World Rabies Day. This is a greatly neglected disease and it's a disgrace that still that 60,000 mostly children have to die from this zoonotic disease. But that is not what we're talking about. We're talking about emerging infectious diseases which um, have epidemic or pandemic potential. And about three quarters of those have their origin at some point in time in wildlife. That's why um, we focus on that. And just to highlight how quickly these, or how, at, at what scale they have increased in the past five decades, there's been 11 outbreaks of Ebola virus um, in the DRC. Eight of those occurred in the past 13 years and four of them occurred in um, 2018. My team's actually working on the ground um, on this interface, Ebola interface in the ROC. In the Republic of Congo and um, two days ago we got notification that most likely the ongoing eastern DRC outbreak has now crossed the river into the ROC as well. So um, this is just um, really uh, highlights how, how quickly and how, how these have increased in the past. So just the context again emerging infectious disease with epidemic and pandemic proportions not talking about other zoonotic diseases. So what do we know about SARS coronavirus 2? Um, we, I think there's broad consensus. We all agree that there's at least a zoonotic origin at some point in time. Ancestral host is most likely in a horseshoe bat species. What's really unclear though is the time, place and mechanism of spillover. There was obviously some kind of amplification event at the wildlife trading section in the, the Wuhan wet market. Um, there were some 500 environmental samples taken. Um, they're not well defined. They have not been shared in the peer reviewed literature, but 31 of the 33 positive ones were recovered from the Western part of the market where the wildlife was housed. Unfortunately, the quality is very bad, these samples, and only four of them could be sequenced. And those were actually identical to HU1, the first human, um, SARS coronavirus 2. So basically information is lacking, it's unfortunate, but um, from a veterinary perspective, I can sort of, the, the reaction to clear out the place and disinfect it um, sort of makes sense to me if I was responsible. But obviously we're never gonna get those samples again, obviously. None of this is a surprise. Um, I'm sure you've, you all this is, you know, as I say, it's not rocket science. Um, we, we knew this was coming. Um, we knew it was going to be a respiratory virus, most likely 2018, 
Um, this has been put on the watch list of priority diseases at the WHO. The United States had a, you know, a really good playbook on how to deal with, with this kind of disease. Um, they, they obviously didn't heed, heed the advice. And so we're in the situation we are right now. And but basically the summary is it's not about bat soup, civets, pangolins. It's not even about specific um, viruses at all. It's not about coronavirus or anything else, really. It's just generally about interphases and this increase of the interphases and contact between humans and wildlife, which occurs in, in many different forms. Here, you know, a classic uh, logging road or something. And, you know, right and left of the road, you have naturally evolving pathogens in wildlife hosts and these evolve, they don't cause disease for the most part in wildlife, but with the road, you provide that opportunity for them to spill over into humans and into their wild, into their livestock. And then with the um, connection and interconnectedness of these roads, you, you quickly reach the larger urban centers. And from there, it's just a small hop into the, you know, mega cities around uh, Europe, uh, Asia, and um, Africa as well. So, this is one of the things that's really changed to, for those of us who were around in 2002, 2003, already working and involved at least peripherally with SARS. Um, the big difference is just the amount of people moving around on the, on the planet. And um, it's estimated that about a thousand people traveled from Wuhan to, um, from Wuhan to, uh, New York on a monthly basis, and that's just one, one city. The other thing that's really important, I think, to, to recognize is that spillover events happen quite often, but for spillover events to actually, uh, for, for a virus to spill over into a human, acquire the traits necessary to then transmit between human and human, that is actually quite rare, thankfully. And there's a lot of barriers which need to align um, for that to happen. There's been um, quite a lot of um, publications recently of uh, anyone who, who <laughs> had time to publish anything related to Corona has been doing that, obviously, but there's been some really nice work showing how important these edges of destruction were, that um, this movement of people in the first few hundred meters into the forest are the most important areas. And these um, are probably central for spillover events happening. And similarly, there are modeling exercises which also show that the size of um, outbreaks depend on the, the amount of destruction, um, in this case, deforestation, for example. Once you've completely deforested a place and put um, asphalt over it, then you're fine, of course. But it's these areas of medium um, destruction, so to say, and interventions which are the, of most risk. And there's numerous papers, of course, that have showed that. And Sylvia already pointed out um, and the, the number of this estimation of the you know, 1.7 million unknown viruses of which some 700,000 are thought to have potential or um, to infect humans. And this is a really central point for me and this is something I've been really highlighting. This is why for me, there is absolutely no reason to speak about high risk species. I think this is a, a, a fallacy to think about if this problem in the, in the sense of, of high-risk species. Um, I also think any interventions that rely on vaccines and similar things, what, as useful as they are, stopgap measures uh, are, as, the, as I say, just stopgap measures. So for every coronavirus, we know there's thousands more out there. And, um, We've, we've spent, WCS is working on many of these, um, on the front line of many of these um, interfaces. And um, more than 15 years now of market sampling and surveys and viral detection going on both in Africa and Southeast Asia. And the amount of viruses we find each time is just it's extraordinary and it's only limited by funding basically. And then the special interface, of course, I've been focusing on and which I wanted to point out at the beginning is if you grab all these animals, either across the region or country or across the globe, keep them alive and then transport to, a, to an industrial size commercial market in Southeast Asia and then stack the animals on top of them, each other, 
mix them up with domestic livestock, um, mostly poultry and, and swine, you're just creating the perfect um, conditions for recombination events to occur. And recombination events are at the, at the core of, of the original SARS, but also the MERS outbreak, and um, appears to be a, the similar for the SARS coronavirus too. And what you do need for, for these recombination events to occur is live animals, and you need a live cell to be infected by two viruses at the same time. So creating conditions, as Amy had already pointed out, rightly pointed out, these are the conditions we need to um, really stop. There is no way, as far as I am concerned, of managing these or sanitizing this condition. If you tried to apply for a permit to do this in an experimental lab, it would probably be banned. You would never get a permit to do this. Um, this put a hundred species of wildlife in the room and then see what viruses come out the other end. I think um, you'd have a hard time getting a permit for that, even if you had a BSL for that, I guess. But of course, it's not about the markets, it's about the entire trade chain. And some of our recent work has shown that um, positivity. So this is a species, these are field rats, which is sort of a, um, uh, a summary of different um, rats which are used for consumption widely. It's really important to point out, this is not an endangered species. CITES and suggestions related to CITES has nothing to do with this. These are commercially raised, they, they're also caught in fields, so it's a very porous um, boundary between um, commercial raising and um, capture. But as you move them through the wildlife trade chain, as you move them from the field site into the kitchen, basically, what is happening is that positivity to coronavirus increases. And it increases from some 20%, below 20% of the field site. Every second rat in the kitchen is then positive by the time it gets there. So that shows this amplification along the um, uh, along the chain, trade chain. I'm going to skip these because I'm obviously um, talking to an audience that knows all these background. But um, as I said, the the virus, uh, the 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 vaccine. We're all waiting for the vaccine, of course. But this is not going to address. We we need to move way beyond this vaccine if we want to tackle this in the in the mid and the long term. We need to really change our interactions at these interfaces in these very diverse and context-specific interfaces. So I agree completely that everything is very context-specific, but um, I'm just going to jump over this. So one of the, the other things that's come up, there's a nice paper which came out from Andy Dobson's group with a lot of co-authors on this and the costs involved. And as Amy has pointed out, it's very complex. There's a lot of things that need to be done. And obviously banning um, the trade, the commercial trade in wildlife is only one small aspect. And it's unfortunate that these things never get read. Actually, the policy behind a statement is ne probably never read and is instantly attacked on, on Twitter and media. No one bothers to actually read the, the nuance or read the actual statements that are made. But here you can see sort of the, the, the estimate. We, we're talking about a tens of trillions of dollars of economic damage at the moment. And the prevention costs are in the, in the order of tens of billions for over a period of 10 years. And these are thought to greatly reduce um, uh, the occurrence uh, of, of future pandemics and epidemics. We always talk about uh, pandemics, but of course we, we need to also quite aware of, of um, epidemic proportions as well. So I think that's something um, that's a good guideline. And I think there's a lot of co-benefits here which have not been um, included in this calculation um, at, the, at the time when they wrote it, or at least they only included um, a smaller um, proportion of the actual co-benefits. Now, one of the things I, I wanted just to quickly, this is standard um, FE spillover uh, graphic, um, explain where we like to work, and I, I have to admit, I also like to work in this area. I like to work in the forests of Africa or Southeast Asia on markets, sample, describe new virus. It's, it's easy, um, it's interesting, and we always find something, of course. But I like to sort of take that assumption, turn it on its head. And as I've moved up in my career and I'm more um, 
unfortunately more and more away from these front lines and working more with administration and decision makers, I really po pose the question, where are these front lines really and where should we be engaging our efforts and our investments? And it's certain that, the, that we, we'd neglect the scientists certainly engaging at the really difficult conversations about wealth accumulation, production, um, ignoring the, the costs of these um, production externalities and so on and so forth. I think this is something we need to, to address it's, and it's tricky and it's been quite a um, challenge, but also quite fun to do that <laughs> position sitting in New York um, and with government representatives here and, and others. So, you know, the idea of the Anthropocene, but are we really in some capitalist scene? I think that's quite something interesting to um, discuss. Unfortunately, that will um, pass the, uh, you know, that will, it's too much that we can discuss today, but I'm happy to take questions and discuss it. So, um, just in summary, this is the position of WCS and I, um, and, and also of our health program, and that's just based on, you know, our work in the past 15 years on um, mostly virus detection and behavioral change in the areas is really the banned commercial trade of wildlife for consumption and the focus here on the commercial industrial size of course particularly focus on the um, on the live animal trade while we as we work towards it obviously recognizing needs and rights of the indigenous peoples who are absolutely dependent on this on this um, wildlife and this is the thing that I think that's really been um, forgotten. These industrial markets, this huge trade, commercial trade of wildlife is emptying out these forests and making it more difficult for those communities and indigenous peoples who are reliant on, on um, wild meat to actually access it. So this is, and there is, I think there are, far too many romantic, I, I, I use the word romantic, romantic ideas about what Africa, for example, in the Congo Basin looks like nowadays and how this trade is happening and the movement of wildlife out of the forest into huge cities with millions of people and the risks associated with that. And obviously coming from a conservation medicine, uh, we, this can only be addressed really in a very holistic one health approach and tightly integrating um, one health with the public health um, systems of the, of the countries and so on. There's quite a lot of resources on WCS, so feel free to go and visit that. And I, I'm not sure, but I'm, I think we will be sharing these presentations afterwards as well. So thanks for your attention. Uh, where's my thing? Many thanks, Chris, that's great. Uh, so let's have, um... Uh, let's have questions. So if you put your hand up, that would probably work quite well. If you go to participants uh, um, and then stick your hand up on that, then um, with a bit of luck, I should be able to see you. Any questions? Mike Mulder has a question that he's put yeah. in the chat. Mike, do you want to, yeah. can you unmute yourself? And then, Mike, and then, we'll, and then we'll go to Emma. Okay. <laughs> there he is. <laughs> right. Thanks, everyone. That that was that was fascinating. Um, I've got a question. Actually, any of the any of the speakers could answer it. I've been promoting restoration of urban habitats for many years, and talking to city governments, private landowners about bringing wildlife back into the city. And I remember a conversation in Rio de Janeiro a year or two back where the golden lion tamarinds that were once the pride of the city were now seen as conveyors of, of Zika. And I'd really like to know the, arg the argument that I can present for still talking about the advantages of urban rewilding and bringing semi-natural ecosystems back into cities and corridors between wild areas and cities when for a large proportion of our society they'll see they'll see that now as a threat thanks can, can one person answer this who's going to answer this silver 
I, I'm only going to very briefly discuss this. Uh, I think Chris is probably a lot better uh, positioned than, than me uh, from a veterinary perspective. But one thing I, I think is actually very important to mention in that uh, specific urban wildlife discussion is the enormous importance in pest regulation that some of the wildlife, specifically bats, for instance, provide for, for humans. Um, you know, bats actually are enormous insectivores, but uh, specifically they eat uh, gigantic quantities of, um, of uh, mosquitoes, for instance, and a whole range of, uh, of other um, species that are obviously of direct relevance for disease transmission. Chris, do you want to add to this? Yeah, it's a, I mean, it's a really, really good question. And I mean, that's the, the unfortunate thing is that we're all sitting on this gradient and it's, everything's a gradient and everyone wants simple answers. And that's just, it's terrible. And I can see the questions in the, in the chat here, absolute valid questions also from Emma here. Uh, so we have to deal with the, you know, with the complexity. Now, an urban wildlife is an interesting one because I actually, I live in the Bronx and we have urban rabies. So... And, and we have skunk and we have raccoons. I have them outside my house. When I see them in daylight, I'm like, oh my God, what's it doing? Oh, it's looking funny. Oh dear, it has rabies. So that this is a real actual risk. And if you pair that then in a sort of in a one health approach, if you pair that then with people not having health care, which is the case in the Bronx for a certain percentage of the population, far too large percentage. But this is actually a real risk. So, um, you know, most people know that here. It's interesting. Everyone sort of seems to know that if they see skunks and raccoons walking around weirdly during the daylight, they keep away. But every now and then you will get children bitten. And there was a beautiful paper published on um, a raccoon in, in Central Park. People were feeding them. They went out and captured them. And I think they found 15 positive uh, rabid uh, raccoons at the time. And we were doing a similar work in the urban centers around uh, San Jose in, 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 uh, in Costa Rica. And we have the same problem, salmonellosis. Um, they share um, uh, homes and especially homes that have cats, the raccoons will come in and so on and so forth. So you have this interface. So this, <laughs> the simple answer is it really depends what wildlife you're going to be reintroducing. And then it also depends on how good is your healthcare, how good are you picking up on these diseases, how good is the surveillance, and how good are people informed about how they should interact. Thank you. Emma, do you want to appear and uh, ask your question? Hi, thanks. Uh, very interesting presentations. Uh, Chris, I share your horror when I see people feeding pigeons and squirrels in London parks. Even in recent months, it's remarkable. I was really interested to hear WCS um, wants to ban commercial wildlife trade or, or make it illegal, which is an interesting contrast. So does this include Western countries? Does this include the commercial sale of, of venison, deer, elk, pheasant, grouse, and other more pretty much wild species that we hunt and eat in Western countries? And if not, why not? And of course, there's a whole interesting discussion of when is a species game and when is it bushmeat? Right, yeah. So you can imagine, as you can imagine, <laughs> this has been my life the last few months. Um, and as a good old Austrian and um, who, who loves to eat a chamois and go out and hunt them and eat them and all the rest, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a difficult place to be. Now, um, we're, while the messaging is always very blunt, obviously well-regulated and um, trade in wildlife as it happens in many countries, in, not only in Europe, it happens in the United States, it happens in, in Southern Africa, other African countries, game species for consumption is well regulated. There is a clear um, sanitary measures and permitting which needs to occur for that um, piece of meat to be traded or uh, go to market. And those of course would be exempt. And as we've been working now with the Chinese authorities on this, on legislation, which by the way is a, a, a fun piece of work, um, that is exactly the same thing. They have a list of probably some six to eight species which they are definitely not going to ban because they have actually good 
good regulations in place and diagnostic capabilities. I think the, the main point is always what we're really worried about are not these livestock diseases which we've known for decades. We may not have got um, on top of them adequately, but we know about them. And so the risk is so much less because we actually have measures and diagnostic capabilities to pick them up. What we're really worried about are the unknown ones. And what we need to, from my point of view, the most pragmatic thing is to limit the unknown risks, these unknown viruses with unknown clinical um, expression and transmission dynamics and so on. That's why we need to limit and, and basically ban these live wildlife and stacking them on top of each other and so on. But obviously, um, we would be always working on a ban with a positive list instead of having a negative list. I think that's the problem with the idea with the high, um, with the high risk species with the negative list, we would work with a positive list. Thank you. So um, uh, final question, could I ask, uh, starting with Amy, what, um, what they think is gonna happen next? What are the signs of the direction of travel? And um, what do you think is going to happen in the um, short and medium term future? So, uh, I mean, I don't know what's happening tomorrow in anything, so who knows? Um, <laughs> but uh, no, I think so. I think all these, while I disagree with banning all wildlife trade, I do think these calls for total bans. Um, have made more people think about things these these issues and i do think i do think it's on a lot of people's agenda now and i think people uh governments are looking more into regulation and i think um i well i mean what i hope will happen is that the the options that we presented will be taken seriously and people will actually look at what is the most um uh, suitable for them but uh yeah I, th I do think we'll we'll see more regulation i just hope it, it comes along with uh actual taking seriously things like enforcement and consumer behavior and trader behavior and things like that too i didn't really answer you sorry thank you anyone else so will chris want to say anything i just very briefly i would say that actually i i think what we are discussing in relation to uh, total bans or regulation are basically very similar things. Um, the idea is that, uh, as Chris very rightly points out, there are things that are very uh, e easily regulated and that do seem actually to function well. And therefore, I think the, the, um, the best thing would actually be to see whether that can be implemented um, across. And certainly, um, as Chris knows very well, um, many of the of, of the options actually in the solutions can specifically focus actually about the, um, the terrible aspects of uh, of mixing wild animals and those live markets which clearly are you know terrible accidents waiting to happen there's there's no question about that so i think the regulation should probably start with those those are i mean when you look at uh, um, especially actually how, how chris was phrasing it it's it's surprising it hasn't happened before to be honest one last word, Chris. Yeah, thanks. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. It's always fun to have a discussion like this, and it was great to to see at least um, Amy and, and Sylvia and yourself um, and everyone else on this call. I look forward to to visiting with you all in Cambridge in better times, and um, we're going to move forward helping um, some of the countries in Southeast Asia developing legislation, um, which is you know is tedious as you can imagine sort of uh, using our normal um, veterinary public health approaches. And um, I'm sure we'll be interacting each and every one of us and developing this together. So thanks very much. Great, I'd like to um, thank our three speakers. Uh, thank everyone for attending. Um, uh, always interesting, there's uh, lots of deeply scary statistics, particularly about the scale of what could, could, could be out there. Uh, the number of coronavirus is kind of mind boggling. Um, but thanks very much for our outline. And I know that we come with different perspectives, so it's great to have a sort of harmonious discussion and, and look at the different perspectives and what the ways forward are. Uh, so there's another lecture next week and look forward to seeing all of you there. And thanks very much to everyone for attending. Thank you. <laughs>